Okay, here we are back with more conversations with Al. We're going to pick up last week. We were looking at a little more detail of individual graphic scores. Most of these from the from the 60s. I think we had some more than 60 scores that we were going to look through. So we got through about half of them last time. Mm -hmm. And um, so let's just dive back in. We're we're looking at the Brun, another of these. Right. We've talked about this a couple of weeks ago, mm -hmm. the computer graphics, um, which <clears throat> are from 1967, and they are um, they are the first uh, the first such um, use of the computer uh, for musical notation, as far as we know, or at least any of the computer music historical textbooks are still willing to say that. Um, and um, so they're they're you know they're they're dear to us for for being uh, sort of the next pieces after the Feldman uh, 1964 King of Denmark. <clears throat> so they're very early in the whole history of these things, but they are the first ones. So I just put one example here. This is the one um, stalks and trees and drops and clouds. And what we're looking at clearly, this is a tree and these are drops. If, if the page were, let's pretend upside down, then you would see stalks on the bottom and a cloud on the top. <clears throat> um, Pretty sophisticated. I mean, it takes it, it takes a while, as we said a couple of weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Each performer would choose different instruments um, for each of those symbols, and basically down on the bottom, they are dry mm, instruments, and up on the top, they're ringing instruments. And we talked about this quite a bit in depth in in that uh, previous conversation. So maybe I can put a link to that down in the comments or something. So um, if you're interested and in, if anybody's interested in this one, they can go hear that very in-depth <laughs> conversation about that one. Uh -huh. It's one of three of the solo percussion pieces. And then at the same time, um, let's see, how do we find out? Well, I guess I have to do it this way. Um, hmm. um, <clears throat> Also, then in 1968, this is this is one of the um, pieces that are in in a series of things. He first called them. Uh, the first series are all called mutatis mutandis. They're single pictures of big systems, which he did for the rest of his life. They got to be very beautiful, complicated pictures. But already back then, he started to look for ways to pull them apart to pull the computer picture apart into individual lines to make them a little bit more um, friendly to readers of, of music. <clears throat> so this is a trio. Uh, he gave this to me, uh, you know, one of, one of the last times I saw him. Um, he gave this one to me. He, he said he was just talking ab about the mistakes that the computer would make, and, and he thought it was often tremendously frustrating and a waste of his time, um, but um, sometimes very funny. And this one, he said, well, this one doesn't count. It's a mistake, you know, because it's supposed to be, as you see, you know, three separate lines uh. and the computer is not supposed to connect. You know, this here, the computer connected from part three up into part one and then back down into part three. And that was against Herbert's rules. He wanted it, you know, just keep it clearly in three strata. Mm. Uh, so he just laughed at it. But I said, wow, that, that's really interesting. I think, <laughs> <laughs> I think for me and my colleagues or, uh, or two friends um, would be an added level of, you know, how you're going to relate to, um, to, to your, to your partners and this sort of thing. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, Sylvia Smith publishes a, a one full, he made, again, once you have the program, um, um, once he had the program, you could sort of generate an infinite number of these things. Um, mm -hmm. And Sylvia Smith has published a folio of and uh, at least some duos and maybe some trios, some quartets, you know, different ones. These are called floating hierarchies. 
Um, as I said last week, some of these pieces are not, um, there's no reason we should, we should know them as percussionists and there's no reason that we need to even think of them as, as you know, masterworks of that moment. But it's another example from this wonderful um, era in Polish music, and I think we talked about it um, a little bit last week. Um, though Penderecki, you know, is the most well, remained the most well-known name. And um, <clears throat> um, this is a piece, of, oh, let me just make sure on my list here. Yeah, mm, Slazonic is the name. It's not a composer I otherwise knew. Uh, it's also from 1968, uh, Mutanza, I mean, Mutations. It's again one of these pieces for inside the piano. And this is, again, much more likely that a percussionist would do this. But again, you can see here um, the idea of just drawing the piano as, a, as an activity base and different regions of the piano. And again, there's all kinds of um, uh, detailed instructions of when it's on the keyboard and uh, what all of these things mean. Um, but I like the idea of these, they're kind of topographical maps, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. <clears throat> we talked uh, last week about the uh, Habenstock Ramadi piece, Liaisons, um, from 1959, that piece for vibraphone for one or two and maybe a pre-recorded. This is another piece by, by Habenstock Ramadi called uh, Je four, meaning, you know, I don't know, a game. Debussy has a piece called Je. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a quartet. And uh, clearly enough that he writes the title on all four sides. Mm. Um, the four members of, it's a percussion, it's specifically percussion quartet. There's a whole many pages of instructions, what it all means. And uh, again, a lot of the symbology here um, is, is something that comes from the Stockhausen Zyklus, though it doesn't necessarily mean that exactly. And he adds all kinds of new things about how you relate to one another. Um, Mm, shall we say it's, it, uh, you know, it's a carefully controlled improvisatory kind of situation. Um, I'm having a little trouble here. <laughs> well, okay. There. <clears throat> Another beautiful, beautiful piece that I just had to throw out on my floor um, because there was no way to show. I think maybe I have one single page. This is also from 1968. It's called um, Seismic Possibilities by uh, a British composer who was a friend of Cornelius Cardew, um, uh, uh, L. Scott Baker. Um, and I was in touch with him because in those early years, I, I through Frederick Jeffsky and through Cardew having come to Oberlin when I was a student, um, amazingly, uh, it, it was very kind. You know, he, he wrote letters. <laughs> he answered letters, letters and uh, made suggestions. Well, why don't you, you should be in touch with such a guy. And he said, you know, uh, um, that this person was making beautiful things. So you see these things laying on my floor here. This is even, well, look, Cage had already made transparencies um, earlier in the 1960s. Mm -hmm. These are more what you, an artist would call, you know, a piece of vellum paper. Mm -hmm. You can see through them, yeah. but it's also, it's a beautiful piece of paper. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and um, um, I, you can see lying under here, uh, it's a kind of a big poetic instructions about it. Um, once again, one would almost have to say, you know, it's a kind of controlled improvisation. Um, are the are the discolorings on the vellum pages of just, I mean, from age, or were they already were they designed that way? <clears throat> or are they from my um, photograph? <laughs> oh, are they from your picture? Yeah, I guess. I get this picture. All uh, two of those things, 
They clearly have discolored um, since 1968. They, they've gotten a little darker and not completely um, uniformly so. Mm -hmm. um, but also they look a little bit odd here okay. um, as, I, as I look at them. Um, yeah, here's another page, uh, a, a, single, a single page um, of one of the quartet uh, players. He gives some suggestions as to what, um, what instruments you might use, uh, and he, he encourages contact mics or, you know, whatever was a lot, live electronics available in the 1960s mm -hmm. to make some of these things happen. Um, <clears throat> This, maybe even this one right here, um, the very first brochure of the Black Earth Percussion Group um, had a, a, a couple of excerpts from this piece, uh, pictures from this piece. Huh. Uh, my friend, uh, I, I had a friend at Oberlin roommate um, design it and, uh, and, and I gave him this, you know, I gave him a bunch of things and he of course, saw that this was a particularly beautiful one to look at. <clears throat> um, of course, most people recognize immediately George Crumb. George Crumb, yeah. Um, again, this whole question of what 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 gets to be called a graphic score? What does that mean exactly? And somehow, uh, and I don't really want to have a a clear definition, you know, where we draw the line of, of what is um, standard notation and what is a notation, an, an inventive, creative use of standard notation, and what mm -hmm. is an artist just throwing something out. Yeah. Um, but uh, same, same time period, this one happens to be from the piece called Songs, Refrains and Drones of death um, from 1968. <clears throat> um, two percussionists are involved in this, but these, um, his beautiful way of, of making, um, um, again, like the, like the um, Martin Farron piece, ha, huh, I never thought of this, hmm. And I, uh, I mean, who cares, but, You'll remember that last week we looked also at this um, quite wonderful piece of Martin Farren's where two of the players in the percussion trio are playing these wheels and you're always going around with an acoustic notation right. if you're making this ostinato. Um, so that was written some, you know, that's some years after and every, any any composer who was, any young composer would have of course been aware of what what Crumb's notations looked like. So, you know, maybe Martin got the idea from this. Um, there are uh, many Crumb pieces. This is a slightly different one where, you know, you go around the, the circle while the singer is actually doing something else. And, um, and it's, a, it's a very nice way, you know, a Cajun sort of way, mm -hmm. um, a later cage sort of way of, of, of controlling the float. You know, we know we're going to, we know we're all going to be here and we're all going to be there and we're going to get to get there. And nah, that's not so important. In fact, I don't want things to line up. Let it float until you get there. This is one, uh, I, I don't, I don't know how many of his pieces. It's less common. Here's one where he, where you float through <laughs> in this way to arrive at something else. It's more common to see these kinds of complete circles in Chrome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, okay, so like this. There it is. Um, oh, yeah. Guiro, you see 1969, <clears throat> the German composer Helmut Lachenmann. Um, this is, uh, for piano. Um, uh, it's just for the piano keyboard and these are, uh, again, it's a piece maybe more likely to be played by a percussionist because you don't make any sounds, but these are, these are, this is the entire um, range of, a, of the piano keyboard and this is everything about, you know, all the, you know, the kinds of sounds and gestures to you know, use, using using your fingernails or 
we have the little knots about where you would get caught and make 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 a little sound, quick gestures, controlling slow gestures. Um, so it's uh, it's indeed a <laughs> the piano, the 88 keys of the piano become a huge and somewhat gentle, quiet hero. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, Stuart Gerber, when we saw him do this piece recently, he showed me afterwards and he had, he had oh. <laughs> injured his thumb because he had, you know, been kind of aggressive with some of those things and uh, it's a pain, could be a painful piece. <laughs> yeah, and, you know, another reason why, yeah, let the drummers play that. <laughs> not, not real pianists. You know. <clears throat> um, this is uh, once more from um, the the Polish composers, um, um, Saratsky, Kazimierz Saratsky. Um, he wrote a piece earlier called Continuum in 1963 for the Strasbourg percussion, for six percussions. It's really a beautiful, it's a wonderful piece, which already has some of these kinds of notations in it. And this is this piece called um, um, Phantasmagoria from 1971 is for a pianist and a percussionist. So it's a duo. Um, and throughout the piece, it floats back and forth over those whatever 15 minutes or so. Uh, again, you see the piano. This is just lying out the ranges of the piano in the same way he lays out the the ranges of the marimba, the kinds of gestures you do. Um, for the most part, you would have to say, and it looks, reminds me now that I look at it a little bit of the Stockhausen uh, Contacta. Uh -huh. um, it, it's, it's, you know, quite specific music and controlled by, by timings, you know, 17 seconds to do this next thing, 14 seconds to get through this. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. Uh, how, do, how does the how do the note heads work on that? What are, what are you supposed to do with the arrows? <clears throat> I mean, I'm I'm looking. I'm just baffled by that one. I'm not sure what that <laughs> means to do at all. I mean, I sort of get I the get that there's a rhythm there, but then there are all these arrows that go up and down. And what what does that even mean? It's just this. Go that way. Go. I mean, it's a glissando. Oh, it's, it's okay. A, I see. It's a, it's, a, it's a glissando. So the pianist here, and I'm sorry, oh, I don't remember. Glissando. At this moment, it would be, you know, clearly the, of course, the marimbist is on the keyboard of the marimba. Um, and the marimbist is being told, you know, here, make your glissando on the white keys. Here, make it on the black keys. Oh, I thought that was the piano part. That's the... This is the marimba part. Oh, that's marimba. Oh, I see. Now. MBF. Oh, oh, I see now. Okay. Marimba phone. <laughs> yeah. And uh, look at that. It's a cute old fashioned... Uh-huh. Yeah. Form. <laughs> for active marimba. Okay, um, I see now. Yeah, so, you know, so this sounds like... <laughs> Whereas the piano part, um, well, I mean, the piano part really sounds like, why doesn't he give flats and sharps for the piano? <laughs> um, huh. I don't know. Well, maybe, huh. maybe he means on the register, like on the, would that be a thing? Well, um, or I, I mean, the whole thing is laying here on my floor. I could go oh, to well. the instructions. It's, it's, it's not important. I just, I, course, I'm no, sorry no, to no, drag no, us down no, in a detail. I just, this might also be, this might be a notation for, for inside the piano. Maybe it's just on the strings of the piano. Okay. Which is why, I, I bet that could be it. Why he didn't bother with flats and sharps kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. hmm. Um, Ed Miller, 1972 Quartet Variations. Um, it's on the Black Earth album, that first LP of the Black Earth group. Um, Ed Miller was a uh, composition professor at Oberlin in my undergraduate days. And uh, he was also uh, um, an experienced uh, um, valve trombone player. He played jazz, you know, club dates, that kind of stuff. Um, a nice story that, that I, had, I had organized a group of my friends and we called it the Oberlin Improvisation Group. <clears throat> and we, um, we met twice a week and had 
friends, you know, on, the, on, on our, our colleagues in the composing students, you know, make little pictures for us, give us little ideas, or we just did free improvisations. Um, <clears throat> You know, this is like around 1970 or so, something like that. And um, Ed was new. Ed came to the faculty and um, had heard that there was a group of students doing this. And he came to one of our sessions and asked if he could join the group, if we would mind if he joined the group, which is, you know, such a sweet thing for him to. And of course, that was an incredibly that was wonderful. It was a nice input. Um, and, the, and then in my senior year, it was Ed playing valve trombone. I was the percussionist. And there were, uh, there was a cellist. And then there was a composer who played piano, but also, you know, late 60s synthesizers, you know, with tiny little patch bays and little keyboards, you know, Moog-like things. And Ed wrote this piece for us, for the four of us. Um, so that's, and then the next year we started the Black Earth Group. So of course I brought this piece to the Black Earth Group. And um, as he says, for any four um, musicians who like to improvise. Um, uh, F was for free. So it's very, you know, it's very clear that it's sort of a traditional notation, you know, it's left to right in time. Mm -hmm. Loud is a bit, fat is loud, thin is small. Um, you're, this is big glissandos. When you get, when you get this stretch here, you're free to do that. Whereas the third player, up, up, up you know, continues this pulse and then cues the cutoff with this sort of thing. So, you know, it's, it's just a pic pictograph of the kinds of sounds you're going to make. It's quite fun to play. It's these six pages you and play it through as many times as you like, any number, uh, any number of times through and any instruments at all, switch parts, not. <clears throat> um, so there's a nice example of it on that old Black Earth. <clears throat> album mm -hmm. and um uh again um joey van hassel with his uh new endeavor with media press uh publishes a few of these things by ed miller both quartet variations and this one which is called around um from the next year 1973 a, a, a very a lovely idea where this is any number of people again, playing any instruments. So it can be all percussion and it can be all singers. It can be uh, anything. The only stipulation here is that it has to be an odd number of people because you surround the audience. You are around the audience. And isn't this great? F is the first player and L is the last player. And it only has to be an odd number because M is, is the middle player. Middle. <laughs> so, so um, and, and it's controlled by the number of people that you have. So everybody's gonna play this gesture, this very simple, you know, soft to loud, slow to fast. And you just pass it around the circle. So if you have five people playing, um, or if you have 15 people playing, you know, it'll take longer, it'll go slower, it'll overlap, however. And this is a lovely notation system. Here, when the last person has played it, the last person becomes the first person here now. So that one went counterclockwise, no, that's clockwise. Here, taking six seconds mm. to do, so here you have four seconds to do this gesture and it should overlap, you know, with each person. So if you have five people, it's gonna take up, you know, about 20 seconds. If you have however many people, it's gonna be times four seconds is how long that's gonna take. When you get here, it's gonna go back the other way, counterclockwise, a six second, yeah, it's a little forzando. Bum. Oh, I see. So the whole, um, each person takes six seconds, not the whole gesture should be completed in six seconds. Correct. Okay. Um, bum, 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 goes around. Got it. At which point the first person connects to 
the middle person. So we've gone once clockwise, once counterclockwise. And when we get here, when, when the, whenever a middle person um, initiates it, it goes both ways simultaneously. I see. I see. Around the circle. Yeah. Huh. Hmm. You know what? I think I don't know what I'm talking about. But look, this was a long, this was a long time ago. Makes much more sense, doesn't it? <laughs> that the whole thing would take four seconds or six seconds. Yes, right. Yeah, because otherwise it would be, it could be quite long. Right. Well, you'll yeah. edit that out of this and just make it seem like I... I <laughs> my I, policy is no editing on these. <laughs> I'm going back in. It's all in there. <laughs> yeah, because look here, what, what the heck could this possibly mean? Clearly, you have four seconds to get around this half and four seconds to get around this half. So, but that's fun. Here, <clears throat> it goes simultaneously around both sides and both sides do the same thing. Whereas here, when it goes around both sides simultaneously, the two sides are doing different things. You know, this guy was, he's a good composer, a smart, you know, it looks like kind of a simple thing and, and not very sophisticated. Actually, one could really have a look. This is a composition lesson. Here it is. Yeah, composition right. Yep, it's, yep. it's very smart and yep. elegantly done. Yeah. Um, the, uh, it goes around the circle. The first person releases. You have five seconds of silence and you repeat, do it again. So twice through A, A, then you do B. Also very nice is that he gives, um, um, <clears throat> uh, is there only one solo? I mean, here the middle person gets to do a solo. Ah, here uh, the first person gets to do a solo. Hmm. Here's something else I would say. Um, you know, Ed, Ed, Ed is dead. <laughs> uh, Ed doesn't care. Ed, Ed made this thing. <laughs> and um, I think it's a wonderful, well, you and I were talking recently about um, ah, music in the era of social distancing. And uh, I thought of this piece. It's, it's a beautiful, it's, it's a, even if it's indoors. I mean, Ed made it for an indoor event around the audience you know the whole however many people you have are going to be quite socially distanced around the performance space and um <clears throat> there may not be an audience but it's maybe no <laughs> the players might be the audience i think that's yeah. the idea um but but you could also take it outdoors uh, yeah. um, and um, and then there would be comfortable space for an, a social, socially distanced audience yeah. as well as the distance between the players. <clears throat> um, so, um, but what I was saying is that um, 73, 83, 93, what are we, you know, we're 34, we're 40 years beyond Ed's thinking this thing up, um, yeah, I think he'd be delighted with people making use of it, you know, in the era of social distancing or, yeah. or however, you know, if there should be more, if there should be more of these solos, if they should come somewhere else, if there should be other ways to, maybe it takes much longer time or uh, I, I've, it, it invites creative input, I think. Mm -hmm. I like what you said that it's a composition lesson because I feel like with a lot of these graphic scores uh, there can be a lot to unpack about structure and pacing and uh, those kinds of elements with you know with in terms of having a composition lesson here you learn about texture you learn about pacing you learn about uh, you know a general kind of structure like how many times does it need to go before it repeats or should it repeat or, you know, sort of you, you can tease out the, unpack the, the structure of all that and study that. Yeah. These, these as well, yeah. Very well put. And I was just thinking that we said a couple of weeks ago, the one thing that Herbert didn't want you to do was go, please don't do that. Yeah. 
Um, though right here, he might have thought it was pretty funny if you if you played on um, the resonators <laughs> of a marimba. <laughs> and I'm seeing it for the first time in my life. Um, but similarly, you know, th this this is a sophisticated compositional structure of things unfolding in three dimensional space, and you see it this way, and then you see it that way, and then it goes there. And yeah. Um, so, yeah, right. You don't even you don't have to play it. You could study it as a composition. Exactly. Right. Um, <clears throat> Ed Miller, Michael Udow, we had spoken about um, Stockhausen being one of one of the early people uh, feeling the need, seeing the need to invent drawing out his electronic sounds so that live players could could follow and know what it was they were inter had contact in contacta, what they had contact with. And here Michael Yuda does the same thing. Um, uh, Michael was on a Fulbright to Warsaw, Poland, because Poland in the last, you know, in, in the days, um, you know, by the 1960s, one, one of the reconstruction of Poland after the war, um, all of these countries, um, you know, similarly, Germany, why does Germany have all those fantastic um, contemporary music festival, so well supported and well, uh, I mean, the reconstruction in the middle, middle of the 20th century, they weren't, once they had literally reconstructed, built the buildings that had to be replaced, um, tremendous amounts of support for, for, the, for the arts uh, and um, radio stations, new music, composers, all of that stuff were getting lots of support. And that's what was done in Poland uh, um, as well. So to go and have a Fulbright to study with Polish composers, to be at the electronic music studio in Warsaw, um, you might not, uh, might not be an obvious thing to think of in now in the 21st century, but um, back in the last quarter or last third of the 20th century, very much so. Uh, Mike had a Fulbright, was working in the electronic studio. This is <laughs> his verse, you know, somewhat inelegant and funny uh, drawing of all, the, I remember the sounds that this makes. Um, mm -hmm. And this was, um, again, it's from my Black Earth days. Um, it's all my own markings in here. The darker things are what, oh, okay. what Udow had marked. And every one of these things, um, again, it's really, you know, related to Stockhausen. And, and um, in, on this particular page, you get to choose what instrument you want to play. And I drew in, you know, these are little picture pictographs of you know guess what this is the tom tom <laughs> <laughs> is that a log drum bup, bup, maybe um <clears throat> it's mike's piece called acoustic composition number one um it's for it can be for a solo percussionist or for up to four or five because he had the black earth group in mind and we played this piece for a couple of years in the group and um like the Martin Farron piece, again, uh, we see this happening in so many eras of creative music. Martin Farron and Udall had no idea of one another. Farron did it years earlier, but the idea of an acoustic notation where you just draw graphs and pic pictographs um, and describe acoustic events. So you, your composition structure is even composed like electronic music to the level of, 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 of the acoustics of the sound, the timbres of the sound. But you're not telling a percussionist it has to be um, a log drum, you know, maybe, maybe a good cardboard box or maybe a big temple block, or maybe you build your own, uh, you know, um, or, or maybe you find a, a wooden crate or something, you know what I mean? That all, mm -hmm. of those, all of those things would satisfy that characteristic. And you can think through many descriptions of percussion timbres and uh, acoustical sounds where you don't, and Mike, uh, you know, it was the Black Earth days. It was the end of the 60s into the 70s. He wrote a very nice essay that he, that he wasn't, he was writing a piece where you weren't obligated to spend countless thousands of dollars to 
international corporations to buy the instruments that he was requiring. And you didn't even have to be a part of a big uh, university to have access to them. You could play this piece with found objects, but not just anything, you know, read the instructions about what the acoustic properties are of all yeah. those things. So that piece, I think Mike publishes his own stuff these days. You could get that. <clears throat> um, <laughs> um, this is a piece by a Spanish composer, Luis de Pablo. Is this 1973 as well? I think so, yeah, 73. Um, um, a French, yeah, a Spanish composer with a French title, which would translate as mm, praying to God on the balcony, <laughs> something like that, the prayer on the balcony. Um, mm. For solo bass drum, 1973 for solo bass drum. Um, and every page looks very different. This is not not in any way a representative page. Clearly, you, you're making whistling sounds here, <laughs> shouting the word O oh, at this point. You're playing with, uh, you know, with, with different hand gestures. Um, sometimes there are rhythms to be accomplished. Sometimes there are just, again, the topography of a huge bass drum head. Um, but as a solo piece, it's, um, well, 1973, a, a big creative solo for a single bass drum. Hmm. And where is that published now? Ooh. Is it available? You have to talk to your former student, um, Carlos. Oh, is that the piece Carlos played? Okay, I remember him. <laughs> in, yeah. in Panama. Um, Jan Williams, I think, was the first one to play it. Okay. And I believe that I had suggested to Carlos Camacho to get in touch with Jan, and Jan might be able to track it down. Could be that, again, Jan shrugged his shoulders and said, well, I can send you my copy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, I see that you've got this piece up again. I want to get something over here. Okay. <clears throat> so, yes, this is the, this is the Martin Farron, which we, yeah. we, we jumped ahead for a moment last week. Um, <clears throat> so we won't talk about it again. But the, all of the acoustic notation and I'm sorry, except that I noticed something in this in here. I've got to find it. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, here are the <clears throat> the astana of the curiously George Crumb like astana. <laughs> astana. Mm -hmm. I found in one of these brochures that you had sent me recently. Unrelated. What I found right here, I don't know if we can see it in here, but I think right there. Oh, absolutely. That's is it. your setup for this piece. <laughs> Good so, uh, that's, that's my setup. Yeah, so it's, so, pre it's pretty small for people to see right now, but um, because yeah. it's just going to be up in the corner, but yeah, that's, um, that's so it basically. I, I built a dowel harp, you know, it was just a cut all different pieces of dowel. I called it a dowel, dowel harp. And mm, yeah, I think hang on, I'm gonna, uh, let me just go, hang on a second. Um, okay. <clears throat> can you, uh, so you're just uh, turn off your screen sharing for a second so I can make this big. Uh, and Okay, well, this is much bigger. We'll be able to see that now if I can keep it still. There we go. Now, and does my cursor still work? I think so, right? I, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. But so, anyway, that's your, that's your setup for, for this piece. So you can right. see the dowel. The dowel harp up on the top, wood on wood, then scraped. So, you know, it's just a huge guiro kind of thing. Um, uh, this is a small, there was a small break drum hanging down from it so that I could take a threaded, a big threaded rod and, and like a sword, you know, poke it through the central circle of, the, of, of that um, break drum. And so that was metal on metal and scraped. And at the very edge, the very left-hand edge, just out of the picture almost, there was a Chinese tom-tom -tom with a very thick head, and I had an omglocken sitting on that that was metal on skin, then scraped. So you would just push that omglocken back and forth mm. on the 
head somewhere up there on on this um you know it's a uh, you see it's a, it's just two by fours what is that called a sawhorse yeah sawhorse yeah that's ingenious <laughs> yeah that works really well it's ingenious and you know touchingly low tech for oh that's low tech high concept that's what it's all about oh, good, now, what is what is this right here is that are those just the resonators for a, an instrument i can't really tell uh, it's uh, yeah, just a marimba back there. It's just a marimba. Oh, okay. Behind For a second, Gary. I thought it was like pipes hanging or something. No, behind Gary, is, this was okay. a. Um, the entire stage is set for. In fact, the what you see just to the more centralized here um, is the Harrison Fugue. This here, uh, exactly. Was the Harrison Fugue. That's oh, the yeah. Okay. Fugue. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, you see, I, I don't know if my cursor is working, but <clears throat> um, this, you see a table of five brake drums, flat brake drums, yep. and then suspended above the brake drums, what you see are five temple bells. Get a little closer if I can. I, and, and I don't know if the cursor is working, but I'm pointing to the cursor. Right there. Yeah, I'm not sure if mine is either, but they're... Five temple right bells right here. Yeah, right exactly, here. exactly. Yeah. Five temple bells. Um, in and this was an idea that we gleaned, of course, from Harry Parch. The temple bells are are the type that come as hanging ones. They're not dobachis that sat on their own little uh, pillows, but they were the hanging types. So they already had a hold in them. Oh, uh, okay. These are gourds. Gourd resonators. Five yeah. gourd resonators. So yeah. what we took we took a again a threaded rod and uh -huh. uh, we're going to drill the hole and fasten in each of the um like harry parch uh -huh. each, each of those um temple bells was resonated um i also have this here uh oh, uh -oh we're back on oh, sharing so, oh sorry oh, that's okay i was going to just show one more because it had uh, some of these one of these scores on it but that's uh, it's this one yeah uh that's a um Boy, and you know, um, that was this guy that we worked with, an artist who it's all laser. It was, that was all laser projection. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, sorry to digress there. Okay. <clears throat> okay, what is this? Um, I think I talked about this for a moment a couple of weeks ago. Um, <clears throat> we're already into 1976. This is one page of the orchestra score to Cage's piece called Ringa. And um, the, all these very funny drawings are Thoreau. These are little sketches that Thoreau made in the margins of his um, voluminous nature journal and Cage had been working with um, uh, the written materials making masostics and the like out of the written materials and then he realized that actually all of these silly little drawings uh, were also tremendously interesting so he transposed all of these drawings from <clears throat> Thoreau um, the Renga part of it is the um, uh, is the five seven five you see our uh, five beats seven beats five beats and then two seven beats so like a haiku mm -hmm. is you know a kind of syllabic japanese poetry so the, the though it's about thoreau and american stuff that's where the title comes from this is the orchestra score so the conductor just mm, at his own his or her own discretion passes through this, um, 73 musicians are playing loudly this gesture, 49 musicians playing very loudly this gesture, um, as soft as possible, 39 musicians are playing this gesture. The individual parts are then 70, in this case, you know, 39 different parts will have little fragments of this drawing in it. And each musician, does some little kind of thing. So this is the piece that um, the orchestra piece, and you see it would be a very smeary, um, a very smeary is the best word, uh, 
Yeah. Uh, Mark, and this is the conductor score that we're looking at. That, the conductor's score. Did the, I make a picture of the an individual part? I did not. Um, um, so the individual parts don't really look like, you know, the individual parts would have the, the, the exact same uh, you know, seven beats here. They would have the double forte. They would tell you that, that, thir that 14 people are playing it, but there would be 14 parts which had some fragment of this picture. Yeah. yeah. And the idea is then clearly, I mean, look, if, if, and it's for even, any 76 musicians. So you just pass it out. And maybe the piccolo player gets this part of the drawing and the tuba player gets this part of the drawing. Again, it's not it's supposed to be literally low to high, any of that kind of stuff. It's just a way, again, to sort of an indeterminate way of, of preventing uh, taste and memory in improvisation, but mm -hmm. rather controlling densities. And so this is the piece against which the percussion group plays music for three. Right. Um, that's how it becomes a concerto. <clears throat> so as we get to the you know, to the end of the 70s. This is another Oberlin composer, a bit cut off here, Randy Coleman, um, called Format 6. Um, and um, I, and Sylvia Smith is also the publisher of all of these and any number of instruments and uh, an interesting piece where um, he's playing with the idea of, you know, again, in the, in the late seventies, we're still, you know, we're talking about um, somewhat early in the time of the music of um, <clears throat> Reich, you know, Reich and Riley, this uh, comes at the end, the very end of the 60s and through the 70s. There's lots of this kind of tonal minimalist, um, um, repetitive kinds of music. And Randy was finding interesting ways to deal with other things arising out of, you know, blossoming out of and returning to ongoing such patterns, uh, allowing for, you know, uh, other kinds of, you know, some of it is absolutely, it's hard to tell in my, again, this is a, you know, a huge, beautiful rolled out thing that he had printed in some architect, blue, blueprint architecture studio. Um, but uh, some of these things are very, very specific pitches and notes and rhythms and others are drawings of this. Randy Coleman. A very elegant composer, one, <clears throat> one simple page of very, very many. Ken Gaburo, mm -hmm. Kenneth Gaburo, um, was, pri you know, but primarily a, a vocal composer, <clears throat> vocal and electronics, um, was at the University of Illinois at the time that Parch and uh, Parch passed through, but the, at the, the 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 great era when when Herbert Brun and Martirano and uh, Penn, Ben Johnston these people were there. Gaburo was there for some years, and then Gaburo went to San Diego. This is a piece called which is the number Antiphony six, I think, is the number eight. Antiphony number Antiphony number eight. Um, Gaburo wrote at least eight different pieces for live, often for singers, um, or and a, a live plus electronics. And this is a solo percussion piece, Antiphony 8 from 1983. He wrote it for Stephen Schick. Um, so this is a solo percussion piece. And you see, uh, again, a little bit like, you know, Zyklus, uh, not, not so much Zyklus as um, Contacta using the symbols, but you know, it's very specific, it's uh, in time. On the tape are all of these voices. It's an, it's an anti-Vietnam kind of uh, war piece written, as late as 83. And all of these colorful things are, are whimsical pictures of the electronic sound, yeah. but there are voices on the tape, uh, interviews that Ken did with on campuses with young people about the war and at pr protest movements. Um, again, just another, I, I like the idea of, um, of the creative ways in which composers cared about the aesthetics of these things. I mean, this is, it's beautifully elegantly done. Yeah. Um, 
I don't know, is this beautiful and elegant? It's just crazy, right? <laughs> um, do I have more than one of these? I do. Oh, wow. um, this is Anthony Braxton. Um, the, uh, the uh, you know, maybe known a little bit more um, as a jazz player, or initially, you know, in the late 60s, a great, great jazz player who, uh, soprano sax, but bass clarinet, everything, but he was part of the Chicago Creative Musicians Association and uh, ended up as still, he's recently retired at Wesleyan, but he taught creative music on the faculty uh, out at Wesleyan for, for many, many, many years, but continues, you know, his, his, mm, tours of the planet of crazy improvised music. And um, I think this is called the Falling River. Uh, yes, Falling River music. <laughs> and there's also a whole series of called, do I have anything else here? Um, yes, this is, this is from the series called Ghost Trance music, referring, I mean, again, socially conscious, he's thinking about the, you know, the, the, uh, the ghost dances, ghost trance dances of the uh, Native Americans at the end of that whole tremendously sad era as their culture was disappearing and they had these ghost dances. <clears throat> Um, um, and there's a whole series from, I think, the late 90s into the early 2000s of Anthony's music. This is, you know, a trio. And all of the, you see, these little symbols, these little pictures, they're also, um, can I go backwards? Why won't it let there? Oh, thank you. If the same pictures are showing up here. They all mean something very specific. And um, they're, they're, uh, whereas these drawings are meant as inspirations to personal improvisation, all of these pi pictures mean something about how you're responding to your own uh, uh, moment of creativity and how you're relating to others in the ensemble. So you do have, there's a language, he calls it a language, and um, it's fun, you can even see, even the ensemble, the people who play with him regularly, you know, sometimes, like, like, I guess, football players or something, they, you know, have, have, you know, I've seen a picture of this, you know, they have, you know, all the plays written on the mm. numbers or something like that, and, you know, it's uh, to remember what all of those things mean. Um, the ghost trance music, th there can be, there will be other parts of this piece, which are um, just, it's just all pitches, you know, just every line will be just continuous um, pitch material, which will then, you know, you'll arrive at the possibility of doing, interjecting these fanciful improvisatory kinds of things. Um, I, so I've ended, I'm ending this discussion with a few, just a few recent things, and um, both from old to older people and newer people. This is one of the last pieces that Stockhausen wrote. This is the one called um, um, Heaven's Gate. Um, um, Tour is the, the door, you know, like a huge portal church door kind of thing. Um, <clears throat> it's the piece he wrote for our friend Stu Gerber. This is the door, the panel of the door, which has has eight, or is it six? It seems to be, so it's 12, yeah. Um, each door has six different panels of wood, and each of those six panels is, you know, independent, so it should be a different material, or sounds a little bit different. But imagine that this picture is a picture of a, of a door, which is, you know, whatever, uh, uh, you know, eight feet high, 10 feet high, and uh, four feet wide, or something like that. It's just a picture of this huge constructed portal. And this shows you where on the door you're banging on that door, <laughs> um, you know, on that pan. <clears throat> and so when Stu plays it, there are even places, any on this page? Uh, none on this page. Um, it's very funny if there's a if there's a marking up here, Stu has to jump to reach to play up there. It's nice pictures of him jumping. Yeah. Shoes that 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 there's a platform uh, 
at the at the at the foot of the door, and this is for stomping with your with your shoes with your feet as you play this. So, in one sense, total it's absolutely specific. It's a totally specific. What is it? Twenty minute, thirty minute piece. Mm -hmm. um, but again, a creative way to notate all of that. Um, the the the, um, the piece by um, what is Catherine's piece called? Um, the waterfall escape. Catherine Catherine Young. Uh, you, you don't see it again. I just uh, you can see here. This is all um, transparencies. Um, you know, these are transparencies in all different colors. This happens to be a quintet. Um, and all of these things sliding over one another. But again, someone who has very specific ideas of absolutely specific things that happen with specific instruments and then spill over into um, other things to do or with the transparencies that it'll be different from performance to performance. <clears throat> um, hey, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> How does this one go? <laughs> Um, um, you know, I don't have the, I, I have all the black and whites of this. I don't have it in transparencies. So, um, so uh, John Lane's uh, Sparrow song. Look at there, the sparrows. There they are. Yeah. Um, for, uh, you know, what is there? There's a tape record. There's a pre-recorded yeah. tape. Yeah, so it's for it's for any number of logs, and yeah. um, and you you pre-record layers uh, on the logs, and then play along with your yourself. Yeah, but are are, are there are there, is there a bird song as well? Uh, there, yeah, there's some. Um, and there's there a poem. Is, there's, there's a poem, a poem uh, and a sort of an erasure poem mm -hmm. with uh, there's a, a naturalist at the turn of the century. Um, Burroughs, William Burroughs, not the famous William Burroughs that uh -huh. you might know, but uh, this naturalist. And yeah, it's about the sparrows being the harbinger of spring. And I just made a little erasure poem of that. And yeah, that's... So this isn't even necessarily a representative page. There are many um, transparencies that you just put all in different ways over one another. And, uh, and, and on big, big logs, uh, if you have if you can find a way to access a few, what, four, like four, maybe, you know, mm -hmm. three, you know, I mean, what are they? If like four feet, five feet, six feet, long, four feet, yeah. Long, yeah, big, um, yeah, big logs. Beautiful sounds. Um, I love this one. Oh, yeah, that's... It's really lovely. Um, <clears throat> um, another woman who was a, a, a doctoral student here, she's in Taipei, back to Taipei now, Sinlei Chen. Um, the Pounding of Life. It's a percussion trio that she wrote at my, uh, you know, encouragement. Um, two of the parts are, are fascinatingly, sort of like the Bartok Sonata basically a, 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 a conservative kind of percussion part, you know, xylophone and uh, imagine the setup of, of the Bartok Sonata for two pianos and percussion. And similarly, this one has timpani in it. Hmm. And then um, um, sort of mm, these people, just play their parts, you know, and um, and then there's this beautiful music um, to be created by a third person. <sighs> Why not a third and fourth? I mean, it doesn't matter. Or a third person with with electronics or something, you know. The idea was it was a trio, but you know, even as I look at it now, um, uh, so her own there yeah you see there are places where it actually turns into um chinese calligraphy mm -hmm. and then this is not a specific uh calligram from 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 writing but there are places where they do appear and um did i do more than one page of her no that's just the only page but anyway um um a lovely combination the pounding of life um, 
I really wanted to play it with my colleagues and um, <laughs> I don't blame them. I mean, of course, I was going to do this part. I was going <laughs> to do the cool stuff. <laughs> and I thought Jim should play timpani and Rusty should play xylophone and, there would be, and they'd be great at it. And we'd all be doing what we're really good at. And they said, yeah, it looks like you just want to have fun. <laughs> so, and we didn't get to play it. It's still willing to be played. <laughs> so that piece hasn't been played at all? I don't think it's been played uh, okay. at all. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> this one you know as well. Yes, Apple Bomb. Um, and uh, again, almost not a representative page. This one is from the uh, uh, metaphysics of notation. And um, I think <clears throat> you know, they're just, uh, again, it's what wouldn't you say? It's sort of a, a stimulus to improvisation more than anything. It's a tremendously creative imaginative composer who it's just fanciful kinds of stuff hmm? yeah i mean i think he even says he he didn't know what it was going to sound like you know that was sort of he uh just just wanted to make this thing and um i think um it, it was originally done uh it was like installed in a museum and then he invited handfuls <laughs> of players i think bonnie was she part did. of that yeah Huge, beautiful, huge, beautifully printed versions of this were on the walls of the museum. But also just like hanging, there were some that were just in mobiles and things. So it was a huge, huge thing. But and it then, now exists as a scrolling. You can get a DVD version of it where it will scroll at a certain rate or just individual pictures like you have here. Yeah. <laughs> that's how it can be done now. But that's Mark Applebaum. Here's more Mark Applebaum. I, I'm starting first with, this is the piece called Composition Machine Number One from about 19, I wrote it down. Why don't I remember these things? Um, oh, 19, I mean 2014, so it's- Yeah, I was gonna say it was more recent than 19, it shouldn't be 19, <laughs> 2014. Uh -huh. 2014. Um, <clears throat> Uh, so he's showing you, he's showing us here th that mm, the pictures are going to, and how they, the the sound maker and the the object, which is both a sound maker and a, and an object, an implement to be moved around. Mm -hmm. So there's a CD case, there's a uh, cassette tape, there's a bowl, a pan, a tin can, a cup. Uh, um, a score, which is a, a piece of foil, a, a tree branch, a small tree branch, a chain, wrenches, bottle caps. Yeah. Um, so the, the tremendously fun thing about this is um, that, <clears throat> so here's that, Again, this is the this is the the exact same thing we just looked at. So you see how big it gets. This is laying. This is this is more. This is six feet long. Here, it's a big piece of paper. So um, every time you play the piece, you follow the notation. There's a notation that, that again looks like um, slightly complicated contemporary music of making sounds with these implements, these objects, but not only making sounds with them and playing on them on a tabletop, which is covered with a blank, large sheet of paper, but you move them around, you push them around and you make sounds by moving them around. And after whatever it is, six minutes or four minutes or something of playing specifically notated music, tapping on these things and changing their positions and sliding them and all of that, they end up in a certain position and then you quickly trace them. So this is a trace thing. Here's my CD cover and here's mm -hmm. my book and here's one of the cans and here's the cup and here's the cassette tape and all of the X's are where my bottle caps ended up and here's my Allen wrench and uh, here's my tree, here's the tree branch, all of uh -huh. this tree branch. Um, <clears throat> you then pick this up put it on, a, on some you know, bulletin board for yourself, and then you play this. Um, I, uh, I don't know what it means. He doesn't know what it means, but it means something. 
Uh, it's not a free improvisation at all. You play, you play this. Um, uh, and it's, um, and once you've, um, how is it, let's see. Ah. You don't, you start the performance with your previous version, right? Exactly. So yeah. if this is my last one, it seems to be my last one, this six, you know, it's three feet by eight feet or something right. like that. Huge scroll. Big, big scroll. Uh -huh. So the first thing I do in the next performance is I take this and I unroll it and put it up on a poster board behind my setup and I play it. I interpret this. Then this is a, a very, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, one really feels this. I take it off the poster board and crumple it up. It's done forever. <laughs> Um, and this big piece of, uh, of crumpled up paper, you know, it's the size of a basketball, is the first thing, well, which picture is it? It must be this. I think this becomes the picture of the score. Um, um, you start shoom, sliding it around on the, on the table. And, he, and it has specific, you know, specific, there's a tempo. That's notated. That's a sort of a, another movement or something. So there's sort of notated. like three movements. There's right. the movement, you come and play, play the score you made at the last performance. Yeah. The second movement is to play the totally notated movement where he shows you which implements to put on the table, slide around to various positions. Right. He doesn't tell you what position. He just says push, slide, drag in this rhythm. You know, play da da ga, bum, ba ba, doom. Right. Bum, bum. What, so who knows where? You know, somewhere you're going to push it somewhere. That's the second movement. The third movement is to pick that up, put it up there, and and do and play that. So it's the second time you're playing a huge graphic picture and you have to play it on something other than the instruments you played the first movement on. Having played it once, you roll it up and then the next performance, you play it again for a new audience and a new time and place, you know, and yeah. It's really clever. It's, it's, it's he's it's really, really, really fun. He's a, he's a clever guy. <laughs> Uh, the, the last thing, maybe, I, uh, our friend Andrew Burke. Um, <clears throat> years ago, he was a graduate student here. Um, went through all of my all of these scores of mine. Um, had the idea to go through them and and do what we just did to make um, you know little PDFs of every one of these scores, mm. and then he. Um, beautifully recreated a 10 page piece, um, which he just calls uh, um, composition. I want to say it right. Do I, I, write it? I don't think I've seen this. I didn't know. I maybe I knew he did this, but I don't think I've seen this. Oh, he calls it score collage number one. Wow. It's an art piece. It comes yeah. in a beautiful folder on beautiful paper. He made, you know, it's an, an edition, a signed edition of 10. You know, it, the pencil will say, um, say on it. And what it is, you know, this is from the Ed Miller piece. Yeah. This is from the Scott uh, Baker piece. Um, this is, well, this is from, C from Cage. Um, this is from Paul Stegg. This is from the um, Saratsky piano piece. Um, this could be from anything. <laughs> um, I think that's from mine. That's from Sparrow Song. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, good for you. you it I made it in there. <laughs> um, so, um, I like how you said it could be from anything. <laughs> it's anybody could have done that. Anybody could have done that one. <laughs> um, um, so, yeah, you have to see this. It's really oh, that's it's, amazing. It's really, I didn't know, I, maybe I knew that he had done this, but I'd forgotten about it if I knew. Mm -hmm. Wow. So, uh, is that so? He only made 10 of them, they're not available. He made uh, 10 of them, and I wow. probably have to write to his art gallery in Los Angeles and they probably cost, you know, a thousand dollars. Yeah. <laughs> for, for a signed copy of this art piece. Uh -huh. um, well, 
<laughs> three books, Notations from 1968 is Cage's first book. It's not really his, I mean, he collected, and it's, um, it's not just graphic scores. He wrote to every composer he knew and asked, send a page of your music. I'm doing a fundraiser for an arts organization. So many of the things in this book are crazy, beautiful graphic things. And he wrote to Herbert Brun. It's curious, I never asked Herbert and I, you know, I, I'm not sure why, because uh, Herbert could have sent something. He already had made his computer things and Herbert sent uh, his own manuscript of the trio, you know, um, um, and I was just, interesting why Herbert would have chosen in this context not to send his new computer kind of stuff. This is a, a huge book, a uh, beautiful book that I then show, yeah. yeah. This, oh yeah, this one is crazy. Just one, it's uh, again, one of these Polish composers, Schaefer, I had showed one of his scores earlier, <clears throat> did a book called Intro to Composition, which is, you know, I, I mean, it's, mm, Yes. Do you want to show this one? We, if we turn off screen sharing, we can show the big book easier. Um, <clears throat> let's see, stop here. Yeah. Now, just like this. Yep. Yeah. So look, it's as big as the screen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it, um, it's falling apart because it's from 1973. Uh, it's, um, I, I mean, it's this big <laughs> called Intro to Composition. And um, it's full of two things, composition um, assignments, where he gives, you know, all of the possible permutations. It's like, you know, it's what he, he did by hand, what a computer could do, you know, and here are, I don't need, well, all the possible permutations of this kind of rhythmic sort of thing. And sometimes he does it you know, he, this is the one that I, I made a picture of. Mm -hmm. You know, here are, if I go back, I think, pages of just this. But uh, it's like 10 different elements and then like every possible permutation of those 10 elements. Only something. six. six only elements. six elements, okay. Six elements. Yeah. Those six elements. And then you see. Or five elements. Or yeah. five every possible premier and then he shows you actually the numerical the mathematics the mathematics of how to do every permutation of five elements and then he shows you what that looks like yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, it's you know it's it's awesome it's beautiful um it's mm, communism in poland uh, <laughs> i mean you could you could do that in fact i mean you could actually get that you could have the time and support and money to do that and then he then he got a grant from the polish government <clears throat> to come to this country he rented a car and he drove around the united states in the early in the mid 1970s with the trunk of his car filled with these things. And he sold them like in parking lots in music to, out of the trunk of his car. <laughs> I'm not making that up. <laughs> um, so, the, you know, you can find them in, in good music libraries, you know, Schaefer, Introduction to Composition. And um, boy, they're, you know, they're, it's, it's a beautiful, it has both all of the things that he drew but hundreds and hundreds also of, he got, you know, the permission of various European publishers and composers where there are examples of yeah. um, all kinds of such, um, such musics. Um, the, the only one other, so here you see a little bit more clearly, right? Um, mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so here's five elements. Yeah. yeah, here's the permutation. Three, oh, <laughs> put three, four, one, five, two. Three, four, one, five, two. Here's the permutation, three, <laughs> four, two, one, five, three. So, you know, every, here's a whole row of, if you start with start three. Start with three, yeah. <laughs> you know, et cetera. Um, so obsessive. Oh, strange, right. yeah. But, you know, it's, it's cool. <laughs> <clears throat> Um, oh, there, there it is. So here's this, this book, which was a response 
um, you know, almost almost a uh, half century later, Teresa Sauer's book called, you know, following in the cage, um, the cage idea of, of making a book in that way. And, um, and similarly, she just did that. It was sort of a, uh, just a, just a call for submissions. Yeah. And, um, and so many, I mean, I don't know how many, I, I can't remember how many composers in there, but a lot. Yeah. And, um, you know, by the 20, by the 21st century, I mean, of course you can, yeah, it's a beautiful hardcover book. You can print, print in color and it's full, full of, Again, the, you know, artists who submitted things, yeah. and, uh, drummers who submitted <laughs> things, and uh, you know, things which are for, for fun. Yeah. You know, actually, in this book, um, in this book, Herbert, um, you know, 50 years, almost 50 years later, Herbert was asked again, and this one does have one of his computer graphics in it. This time he sent her a computer graphic. <clears throat> well, uh, is that true? Because he would have passed by then. So someone did. So someone else sent it. Yeah, right? someone else sent that in. Yeah, because that was in... Did I write it down? 2006, oh, 2000, oh okay, published in 09. But I think the call went out in, yeah, 2007, 2008, sometime in there. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see, A, B, C, D, F, G, H. Yeah, I mean, even, you know, photograph, photographs. Of, um, of, yeah, that's a really fascinating book. It's hard to find these days. Um, I did happen to look on just to see if it was still available. And it's, uh, it's very expensive on Amazon. But the best way to get it is probably through a library through, uh -huh. you know, interlibrary loan or something to take a look at it. It's very expensive to buy right now. Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's still available from the publisher, but oh, and there's my yeah, there's my piece. Now, see the one on the bottom there. That's actually the score and the transparencies you just set on top of that one. Yes. Uh huh. Yeah. So that's and this would also be a transparency. Yeah, that's a, one of the transparencies. Yeah. Here's and there's the a little piece of the poem. I look at that and I just I I think that uh, I mean I made that in your class, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and you said, oh, there's a, you should send it in, never thinking that they would pick it and put right. it in there. Uh, and I, you know, I was trying to be very, uh, you know, mysterious or something. And so I just, I didn't send any text about the piece or how to do it. <laughs> I just gave them that little snippet of the poem, thinking that what wasn't I being mysterious and clever doing that. And uh, now I, of course, I look at that and I go, oh, man, I should have said what the piece was and how you do it. And <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> It's very uh, uh, yeah. It's I mean, it's a, <clears throat> one of the great activation projects in that class. Right. <laughs> and, and I, I mean, I was enough in some loop that I, I, you know, I got the information. I got asked. I didn't send anything, <laughs> but I'm delighted that you did. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Well, this is probably a good place to stop. We're um, at the end of the the journey for the end month. of the journey of graphic notation. All right. Well, we'll be thinking about what to do next week. Isn't this stuff great? I mean, it's exciting. I get excited. Oh, yeah. I love it. I love it. It's, uh, it's always, it's really inspiring. And uh, yeah, it is. yeah, yeah. I, I love graphic notation because of the, uh, I mean, it feels like a collaboration. There's a freedom in it. Um, and you can, I mean, I've always liked being the more on the creative spectrum rather than the interpretive spectrum, mm -hmm. you know? And so when you do graphic notation, you kind of get to play both parts. You get to mm -hmm. interpret a kind of creative notation, but then also you get to contribute something to it in a deeper, in a deeper way than you would just reading the notes on the page. And yeah. so I don't know. Yeah. It's really exciting and fun to look at these and it's good to be reminded of some of these things that I'd forgotten about. And for, you know, for many who are watching and listening, maybe the first time they've encountered some of this stuff. So, um, but yeah, very good. Well, thank you. I had a, obviously I had a great time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good. Thanks.